I'd say the most surprising application that I've seen is some glass that has uh, recently been developed to help um, with soft tissue repair in the human body. Um, so this is something that was uh, developed out of um, Missouri at Missouri University of Science and Technology and commercialized by a startup company there called Mosai. Um, and this is, is glass fiber, kind of, kind of like the, the fiberglass that's used in your insulation in homes, but it's, instead of being based on a silicate glass, it's based on a borate glass. So the, the chemical formula is B203. And borate glasses have not traditionally been used because um, they, they soak up water from the atmosphere, they degrade very easily. Um, but in this case, what these scientists discovered is that if you make these uh, borate glass fibers, you can pack them into open flesh wounds, uh, either in animals or in humans, and the fibrous microstructure acts as um, kind of a, a pathway to help uh, the body's natural healing process, which is sort of healing in a, a fibrous type of, of format, the, the glasses will dissolve over the course of a few days. And as they're dissolved, they're releasing elements that help, um, help the body repair itself. And at the same time, they're providing uh, for an antimicrobial environment to help prevent uh, an infection from Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World, where the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And without further ado, let's get right into it. Hi everyone. Today's guest on the show is Dr. John Morrow, a world-renowned expert in glass science and a professor in material science and engineering at Penn State University. He is also an inventor of a new of new commercial glasses, including various Corning Gorilla Glass products. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Morrow. Oh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Puneet. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. And so, you know, just to get started here, at a high level, what are the characteristics that define glass from a material science perspective? So glass is a very interesting material. You know, as, as humans and as scientists, we have a tendency to want to classify things, right? And we normally think of the, the three standard phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And glass is interesting because it falls somewhere in between um, solid and liquid. So if you look at it at the atomic scale, the atomic structure of glass is very much like a liquid. It has a well-defined short range order, a less well-defined intermediate range order, and then a complete lack of long range order. So it's completely disordered at um, a longer length scale, which is in contrast to solid materials that are made of, of crystals. Uh, but if you were to say tap on a glass, it, it certainly behaves um, mechanically like a solid. If you drop it, it will break like a, a solid material. Right. And so it has some of the properties of a solid, but with some of the properties in the atomic structure that are more akin to a liquid. So it, it's falling somewhere in between. Um, and it also has its own unique properties. So uh, unlike you know, equilibrium liquids and equilibrium crystalline solids, glass is an out of equilibrium material or a non-equilibrium material. And so you can't find it anywhere on a traditional thermodynamic phase diagram because it's not an equilibrium material. And in fact, if you wait over long periods of time, it is slowly relaxing towards um, either the liquid state or eventually it will crystallize. So um, uh -huh. glass is also interesting in that it's a transient state of matter. Uh, if you wait long enough, it won't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but presumably when you say wait long enough, we're talking about time scales that humans would never be able to potentially see depending on what that glass material is. So it, it depends on the glass and you're exactly right. And the, the length scale uh, or the time scale that you would need to wait uh, could vary by many orders of magnitude. So for most common glasses, that time scale is longer than the age of the universe. So you have to be very patient. <laughs> very, very patient. Uh, yeah, that, that's a level of, uh, it's an attention span that uh, I don't think I would necessarily have, but, but good to know nonetheless. <laughs> um, and, you know, in our, our seventh episode of, of this mm -hmm. podcast, we talk about 
we had a full episode about ceramics uh, and we learned that there's some technical dispute over whether glass is considered to be a subset of this broader class of ceramics materials or something else different entirely. So can you talk about why that might be the case? Uh, absolutely. And that's a great question, too. So a ceramic is any inorganic, non-metallic material. Um, so inorganic, meaning it's not based on um, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, and non-metallic, meaning that it's it's not a metal. So um, the ceramics uh, encompass a very broad range of materials from you know diamonds to table saws, and including many uh, common glasses as well. So uh, if you were to ask someone in the public just to think of a glass, uh, the glasses that they would think of are typically soda lime silicate glass or borosilicate glass like Pyrex or pure silica. You know, all of these commonly known glasses are, are silicate glasses and silicates are inorganic non-metallic materials and therefore are classified as ceramics. Now there is another newer family of glasses called metallic glasses and these are based on metallic alloys. And so they're, they're, they're metals that are mixed up in such a way that when they're cooled from the molten state, they are unable to form a crystal because the, the atoms are so frustrated, they're not able to, to rearrange themselves in a crystalline configuration. And therefore what you have is this solid-like material with a liquid-like structure but where the atoms are um, have metallic bonding. Um, and therefore, the, this is what's called a metallic glass. So this is an example of a glass that is not a ceramic. Um, there are also many organic glasses. Uh, so you may have seen, for example, the sugar glasses that are used in movies when you see the actors you know, crashing through the windows. Those are not silicate glasses. Those are, are made out of, of sugar. Um, and so that's an example of an organic glass. And by the way, why does glass always have to suffer so much in movies? It's, it's always like the first thing <laughs> that happens. It's, it's carnage. Every time a glass breaks, a piece of my heart breaks too. <laughs> I didn't know that about the sugar glass thing in movies. I mean, that's definitely not my expertise area, but uh, I didn't realize like every action scene when they're like, you know, busting through a window, it's actually what uh, glass, glass sugar instead. So so the like those glass breaking bottles or whatever is that sugar glass too the ones that like break super easily on people's head like in those those movies <laughs> oh gosh depends on how much, depends on how much brain damage <laughs> um, so they I, i'm not sure what they're doing with that they they might also purposely put a a large flaw into the bottle so it mm. breaks more easily because if, mm. if you've got like a a pre-cracked specimen that acts to intensify the stresses and make it a, a lot easier to, to crack. So that's another option, or, or maybe they're, they're wearing a special hat to protect themselves. But, uh, kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> yes, good disclaimer. Now we have there. to add that disclaimer in our episode. <laughs> cool, cool. So we can dive into the, the details of the applications later on in the episode, but from a broader perspective, can you give us some examples of the applications of glass and which, which sectors they are most commonly used in? Uh, absolutely. So glass is a ubiquitous material. It's, it's all around us in our everyday lives. You know, when you think about your, your house or your school building or office building, um, you know, the glass windows allow sunlight to come in while keeping out uh, you know, the harsh cold of winter or the snow uh, since it's Jan <laughs> January here in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, so it's, it's something that's it's so common. We, we don't really think that much about it because we're not really looking at the glass. We're looking through the glass. Um, but could you imagine architecture without glass windows, it, it would be rather depressing. Um, there's also, you know, when you go to the grocery store, glass jars that are used. And I don't know if you've compared like um, juice that you could buy at the grocery store that is packaged in glass bottles versus plastic bottles. What do you notice? That the glass bottles are always in the non-refrigerated section because it provides mm -hmm. a you know, much, much better uh, protection of the juice compared to the plastic bottles, which are stored in the refrigerated section because they will go bad much more easily. So there's you know, mm -hmm. glass packaging for 
uh, for food. There's the glasses that you, you drink out of at the dinner table. Um, there's glasses that are used for pharmaceutical packaging. So uh, one of the, the things that we've seen a lot on the news with respect to COVID-19 and the current pandemic is the vaccine and the rollout of the vaccine. And one of the issues that needs to be addressed is not just the vaccine itself, but how do you package and how do you store that vaccine? So we need to have you know, large quantities, tens of millions of, of these pharmaceutical vials that are made out of specialty glasses to be able to safely store the vaccine without having chemical reactions between the glass packaging and the vaccine, to have the mechanical strength to withstand um, mechanical damage and to be able to, to cool down to extremely low temperatures to be able to safely store the vaccine and not have breakage due to thermal expansion issues. Um, we also see glass in uh, information technology. So, uh, you know, we're looking at each other now via uh, glass screens uh, on Zoom. <laughs> and so glass is used for the display of information. And that goes back to the old cathode ray tube displays, the old style TVs and monitors, yep. and to the modern flat panel displays. And as we're talking to each other, all of that information is being transmitted over glass optical fibers. So these are, are long, thin yep. strands of, of glass that are, you know, have about the thickness of a human hair. And they are propagating just you know, billions and billions of bits of, of information every second and delivering it with extremely low error rates. And so glass has been critical in bringing us into the information age, both in the communication of information, as well as the display of, of information. So, you know, glass is, is everywhere around us in our everyday lives, and, and oftentimes we're using it without even thinking about it. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, you know, we talked earlier about transportation as an application. I'm kind of just racking through my brain trying to think of you know what you what you could mean by that so could you give us some examples of glass in the transportation area oh absolutely yeah that's a, another critical application of glass so when you consider say that the cockpit in an airplane and the pilots have to be able to to see out and and at the same time um, the cockpit, the, the glass there has to be able to withstand, say, the impact from a bird or, or something like that uh, without um, you know, sacrificing the integrity of, of the window. Uh, and so those are made out of thick, chemically strengthened glass, which is the same type of technology that is used, for example, in the Gorilla Glass that's on the cover of your cell phone, but in a, a much thicker variation. Um, so in airplanes and obviously in, in cars and other automobiles as well, uh, we need to be able to see out of our vehicles to be able to drive them safely and at the same time keep us protected from you know, stones that are flying up or, or something else bad that, that might happen. Um, trains as well. Uh, what about uh, the space shuttle? Uh, and rocket ships. Yeah. So there, you know, the windows in the space shuttle have to be able to withstand extremely high temperatures, especially upon re-entry. And uh, those windows are made out of pure silica because that can withstand the highest temperatures of, of any of the commonly used glasses. Um, and it's interesting because when we think about trends in transportation, what, one of the, the trends going forward is um, the rise of autonomous vehicles. And right. there, what we're going to see is that glass is going to play uh, an increasingly important role uh, in the interiors of cars, as well as, as the, the usual um, windshields, because if you're not driving, uh, you need to be doing something else. So there's going to be screens there that will be able to provide you with information or entertainment or access to you know, your email or whatever it is people will want to do when they're, they're riding in the car and uh, not having to actively drive it. Wow. Yeah, I think we're seeing that with the new Tesla cars that's that's like larger screens in the middle and you can just yeah, play games awesome. on it. And yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like when when the gas is filling up, you can play hangman and stuff like that. It's, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> You know, before a lot of our episodes, we like to solicit questions from our audience uh, about some of the topics we're about to go into with the various experts that we bring onto the show. And so today's question comes from one of our, our audience members named Rohit. And he was curious, what is the most surprising application for glass that you have seen so far in your career? 
Wow, that's a great question. Um, I would say the most surprising application that I've seen is some glass that has uh, recently been developed to help um, with soft tissue repair in the human body. Um, so this is something that was uh, developed out of um, Missouri at Missouri University of Science and Technology yep. and commercialized by a startup company there called Mosai. Um, and this is is glass fiber, kind of kind of like the the fiberglass that's used in your insulation in homes, but it's instead of being based on a silicate glass, it's based on a borate glass. So the the chemical formula is B2O3, and borate glasses have not traditionally been used because. Um, they, they soak up water from the atmosphere, they degrade very easily. Um, right. But in this case, what these scientists discovered is that if you make these uh, borate glass fibers, you can pack them into open flesh wounds, uh, either in animals or in humans, and the fibrous microstructure acts as um, kind of a, a pathway to help uh, the body's natural healing process, which is sort of healing in a, a fibrous type of, of format, the the glasses will dissolve over the course of a few days. And as they're dissolved, they're releasing elements that help, um, help the body repair itself. And at the same time, they're providing uh, for an antimicrobial environment to help prevent uh, an infection from forming. And then every few days, uh, you get a new set of, of fibers packed into the wound. And then over the course of a few weeks, uh, the, the flesh has healed. And remarkably, there's little to no scarring uh, at the end of this. And this is wow. amazing because these wounds that, that this has been shown effective at healing are in, for example, um, many diabetic patients have, have these wounds that are, are very deep and they can be as deep as going down to the bone and they simply don't heal. Uh, but this this type of borate glass fiber actually um, helps the, the, even those wounds heal by stimulating uh, the body's natural healing process. Um, so these were first approved for use in the veterinary market, for, for example, with uh, horses and, and dogs and so on. And more recently, uh, it has been approved for use in humans as well. So this is, is now available um, you know, for patients who are suffering from these types of wounds. Wow, that's incredible. So you mentioned that it dissolves on like a short term scale to release, um, you know, the, the things that can aid the healing process. How, how do you facilitate that short term process when, you know, some other glasses kind of have that more of the long term um, degradation scale? So that's a great question, Puneet. And the, um, the, the corrosion resistance of glass depends very strongly on its chemical composition. Uh, in many of the traditional applications of glass, such as glass windows or, or glass packaging, uh, we specifically want glass to have a very high corrosion resistance. So it's not going to you know, dissolve in rain or acid rain, or if you put a highly acidic or highly basic liquid into a glass container, we need to make sure that um, you know, glass is not going to corrode. And those glasses have a high concentration of silica. So silica, SiO2, uh, is known for its very high corrosion resistance. In these borate glasses, there's no silica. So all of the silica has been repa replaced by boron oxide, B2O3. And that is much more hygroscopic, meaning it wants to react with water. And as those reactions take place, um, the elements get released from the glass and uh, the glass corrodes a lot more quickly. And so if, if you change the chemical composition of the glass so, so that it's a borate glass rather than a silicate glass, then it will dissolve a lot more rapidly. And that's what um, that these scientists have done in the development of, of this wound healing fiber. You had mentioned that uh, this this technique for wound healing also had antimicrobial properties of, mm -hmm. of some sort. So I'm just curious how, you know, how does that play into it? You know, as material scientists, we get kind of introduced that certain metals have antimicrobial properties, but how does that work in this application? Um, that's right. And it, it's, so certain metals do have antimicrobial properties. For example, silver and copper are, have very good antimicrobial properties. Right. Uh, and those can be added to the borate glass fibers to help enhance the, the antimicrobial activity. Uh, it seems that even high concentrations of borate itself 
uh, may also lead to antimicrobial effects. But your, your question <laughs> brings up uh, another um, great new application of, the, of glass, and that is antimicrobial touchscreens. Um, so one of the, the glasses that I'd, I'd spent a, a large part of my career working on was the various Gorilla Glass uh, compositions from Corning. And some of the newer Gorilla Glasses uh, are actually ion exchanged with silver ions, meaning that they can load the surface of the glass with silver ions. And if silver is exposed to a humid environment, um, so it, it's going to diffuse out from the glass and into the uh, onto the surface, um, silver will attack um, bacteria. Um, it may even have antiviral applications against some virals and antifungal applications. Uh, so it's a very effective antimicrobial agent. And this is uh, you know, especially important, for example, during this COVID-19 pandemic, and that you know, if there are common touch screens, whether it's like an ATM touch screen or anything where you've got like multiple people touching the screen, yeah. or if it's in say a hospital environment, um, and you really need to help prevent the spread of secondary infections because you know you go into the hospital to um, to heal, not to get infected with something else. Sure. And so having antimicrobial surfaces like like this um, silver ion exchanged gorilla glass can help um, improve human health by uh, preventing the spread or reducing the spread of secondary infections. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even think about the ATM or the hospital settings where those antimicrobial properties are needed. So let's actually dive into that. You know, we are a material science podcast and you do have these vast experiences with Corning's Gorilla Glass. So can you talk more about the material science that's involved in the development of various Corning Gorilla Glasses? Absolutely. So uh, Gorilla Glass is an alkali aluminosilicate glass. And uh, the way that it gets its high strength is through a process called the ion exchange process, or also known as a chemical strengthening process. Now, when Gorilla Glass is made, uh, initially it contains a large concentration of a small alkali ion, um, either lithium ions or sodium ions. And if you take this glass and then uh, submerge it in a molten salt bath, uh, this is around 400 degrees C for a few hours, uh, where that molten salt bath contains a larger cation. So if it's a lithium glass, you could use uh, a salt that is a sodium-based salt or a potassium-based salt. Sure. Or if it's a sodium glass, you'd use a potassium salt. So you s submerge um, the glass in this molten salt bath and what happens? Diffusion happens, right? So yeah. the, the smaller ions will leave the glass and get replaced by the larger cations from the salt. And this leads to a concentration profile of these larger ions uh, going into the surface of the glass. Now, potassium is potassium one plus that has the same charge as the sodium one plus cation. So from a charge point of view, in order to maintain charge neutrality, it's just a one for one exchange. Every sodium ion gets replaced by uh, a single uh, potassium ion, but potassium, since it's larger than sodium, um, doesn't quite fit into the same um, structural location as the sodium. It actually wants to expand because it's larger, uh, yeah. but the interior part of the glass doesn't let it expand. And so the, the surface of the glass wants to expand, but the interior of the glass doesn't let it expand. Mm -hmm. um, and so that leads to stresses being developed. Right. And specifically that leads to a compressive stress being developed in the surface of the glass that's balanced by a, a tensile stress in the interior of the glass. Now with uh, a Gorilla Glass, the, the compressive stress at the surface of the glass is on the order of about one gigapascal. And so if you wow. want to, yeah, if, if you want to break Gorilla Glass, um, you have to overcome not only the intrinsic strength of the glass itself, but also this extra one gigapascal uh, compressive stress at the surface. And, and that's what makes it so strong. Holy cow. Yeah, I did not realize that that is, that is one heck of a compressive stress. Um, <laughs> wow. No, that's a, 
that's really incredible. We learned that's like one of those things that keeps coming up in our material science curriculum is like the gorilla glass process. And um, just even learning more about it through this context really makes me realize like, oh yeah, that's a, that's really a fascinating, uh, a fascinating thing to keep emphasizing to, uh, to material science students. Yeah, there's a, a lot of, of interesting aspects for a material scientist. So one of them is, say, the composition design. So how, how do you design the chemistry of the Gorilla Glass to um, be able to manufacture it um, profitably at a large scale and sure. get the high strength properties that you're looking for? How do you manufacture it in these large flat sheets that uh, can reach the thinness that's required for personal electronic devices and do so with uh, uniformity of the thinness without any types of defects? And then how do you optimize this ion exchange process for doing the chemical strengthening? So there's all types of materials design and process design questions um, that are just really fascinating, uh, especially from a, a material science and engineering point of view. So Dr. Morrow, one major application of glass that has helped the information age is fiber optics. So can you talk about how the glass materials were developed to make this technology possible? Great question, Puneet. So uh, the key breakthrough in the development of optical fiber actually came in 1970 at Corning. Uh, so three scientists there, Keck, Maurer, and Schultz, who, they won the, the National Medal of Technology for this breakthrough. Um, what they realized is that in order to um, develop glass that is pure enough that you can transmit optical signals over hundreds of kilometers, uh, you need to reduce the optical attenuation uh, at those wavelengths that are, are being used for telecommunication. So at the wavelengths where the lasers are, are generating um, the light, uh, the optical attenuation or the optical absorption has to be minimized in the glass. Now the primary enemy uh, is water because water has uh, absorption at exactly the same wavelengths that are used in telecommunications. Um, so they realized that in order to enable this application, they had to get rid of the water. And the key breakthrough was actually a process breakthrough. Um, they used a, a process called outside vapor deposition, which is a, uh, making the glass via a chemical reaction rather than using the normal uh, melt quench point of view. So uh, you know, if you wanna make silica glass, um, the most natural thing to do would be to dig up some quartz and melt the quartz and cool it down into glass. And yes, you will get silica glass that way, but it's going to have a lot of water in it. It's going to have sodium impurities. It's going to have iron and chromium. It's gonna have all types of junk in there. And all of that leads to optical absorption. So in order to reach these high levels of, of purity, uh, what they did was use a chemical vapor deposition process where they reacted uh, silicon tetrachloride with oxygen in a completely water-free environment. And that produced chlorine gas and SiO2 soot. And they deposited this pure SiO2 soot, the silica soot, onto yep. a target rod that was spinning. And basically they, they built up the soot and then put that through a subsequent heat treatment step where the soot was consolidated down into the solid glass, which was the, the highest purity um, glass that had ever been made. And then wow. this, this is what's called a preform. And then the preform is tipped up vertically and then they would heat the tip of the preform and then draw that down into fiber. And that, that's how the, the first uh, fiber for telecommunications had been made. And in fact, if you go to the Corning Museum of Glass, which I highly recommend, it's in Corning, New York, you can <laughs> see Don Keck's lab notebook when he made the first measurement that reached the low optical attenuation that was required for telecommunications. And he famously wrote whoopee right across his lab notebook. He was so excited. <laughs> and you know, it created a whole new industry. It brought, it changed society because it brought us into the information age. Um, and wow. uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing and a very inspirational story. That's incredible. So since that's, that seems like a very much research, like 
project, how do you industrialize that? How do you manufacture that on a larger scale? Great question. There are um, a number of steps that are involved with, with manufacturing of optical fiber. Um, there is the uh, initial soot deposition. So that involves having the, um, you know, the oxygen free environment for doing this reaction between silicon tetrachloride and oxygen depositing the soot. The next step is this consolidation step where the, the soot uh, collapses into a fully densified glass. Um, the next step is the fiber draw process. And that's really cool because you know, that takes place in a building that's a few stories high um, because you need a lot of vertical space for, for drawing the fiber. Uh, the fiber as it's drawn is coated with a protective polymer coating to, to just give it some additional uh, mechanical uh, resistance and corrosion resistance. And then that polymer coated fiber is spooled uh, at the bottom of the draw into a, a, a spool, just like you're using a sewing machine, only bigger. Um, then, <laughs> a few then stories actually, tall, bigger, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, then the next step is, is called cabling because it's not just a single optical fiber that, that gets um, used for, for transmitting optical signals. Um, many optical fibers, like 100 or more optical fibers are put together into a cable and each one of the fibers is in a protective sheath. It's all color coded. So you know which fiber is which at, at each end. And they all get put together in this, this large cable. And then the next part is, is really hard as well. And that's the installation of the cable. <laughs> so <Yeah>. this, <laughs> this um, you know, it can involve for um, terrestrial networks uh, burying the cable. So you've got to dig up a trench and bury it or for transcontinental networks, this would involve um, you know, installing it across the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so that is a very expensive yeah. step. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow. No, it sounds like a, a lot of challenges involved, but obviously the payoff is uh, enabling us to have this, this information age that we oh so lovingly take for granted now. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> and so, you know, in terms of we had we had mentioned this earlier that there seems to be this merging potential in terms of glass applications in healthcare, and so moving forward, where do you see glass playing a role within the biomedical field? Right. So I, I think we can consider it um, as glass packaging for one thing. So mm -hmm. um, you know, as as the development of, of vaccines and other medicines is is proceeding more rapidly we need to make sure that there is appropriate packaging for those medicines. And they can right. pre prevent or present some extreme chemical environments. So, you know, highly mm -hmm. acidic or highly basic pHs, we have to make sure that they don't react with the glass at all. So the, the whole area of, of pharmaceutical packaging is uh, extremely important. So for example, uh, my advisor, uh, Arun Varshneya started a company um, uh, called Saxon Glass Technologies. And uh, you probably know the, the EpiPen that is used um, to, to supply medicine for yep. people who have extreme allergic reactions. And you know, many people's lives have been saved by these EpiPens. Um, and every EpiPen contains a, a glass syringe um, that has uh, extremely high strength. So it has been ion exchanged in a process similar to what I, I just described for Gorilla Glass, only it's in a, a vial form rather than a, a flat sheet. Sure. Um, all of those ion exchanges are done at my advisor's company, Saxon Glass Technologies. And this was the, these advanced glass technologies were able to um, take EpiPens from being a product where you know, there, there might have been some failures without this, this process, which would have, I mean, that could even cost people's lives, um, to now having no known failures um, after making use of this um, chemical strengthening or ion exchange process. Wow. Um, so that, that's an example um, of kind of these, these cutting edge, both materials technologies as well as process technologies in you know, providing a real benefit for, um, for people all over the world. Um, another area is, is glasses that are being used to help, uh, help repair or protect the human body. We already discussed uh, glasses, these glass fibers for soft tissue repair. Uh, glasses and glass ceramics are also used throughout um, the dentistry 
industry uh, for uh, tooth repairs, for example. Uh, glass ceramics are, are replacing metals because they can match the same coloration as the human teeth. So you know, if you get a, a glass ceramic um, filling or tooth replacement, it, it's going to be very difficult to tell that apart from a, a natural human tooth. And it's also going to uh, have the high hardness, the high toughness, the high corrosion resistance, just like natural teeth. Uh, glass powders are also being used in toothpaste. So they're, they're being incorporated into some toothpaste now um, so that these glass powders can uh, say, uh, help rebuild some of your natural enamel on your teeth to take care of, of dentin hypersensitivity, for example. Uh, glasses and glass ceramics are also used um, for, uh, to help with bone repair. So they can provide uh, the high mechanical strength that is, is needed uh, for bones and actually help to stimulate uh, the natural regrowth of bone tissue as well. So glasses are, are used in, in hard tissue repair as well as soft tissue repair and uh, throughout the body. And I think one of the exciting things is to discover in the future you know, what other roles can glass play um, right. to, to you know, help with, with these medical issues. That's amazing. So based on the, there's so many different applications even within the healthcare space for glass. What are the challenges that researchers are facing at the moment in terms of glass packaging, but also glass repair? Oh gosh, um, so many challenges, right? So um, it goes from, from you know, understanding the relationship between the glass chemistry and the, the response that you're trying to get from, from say the human body, uh, because you know, both are so complicated. Glass is very complicated, but the human body is, is of course, exponentially more complicated. <laughs> and, and, you know, how, how do you understand if you are, or how can you design the glass to trigger the response that you want to get right. in the human body? And it's just such a complicated problem that, you know, a lot of it is, is done based on, on what previous research has found and kind of taking steps from there. Uh, or through experimental trial and error. And so if we can you know, design studies to really understand what is going on at the chemical level and at the physical level and, and what leads to um, either getting or not getting the desired biological response, that's a, a major challenge. So, um, you know, that's the healthcare space. So let's move on to architecture applications. So. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned, you know, if, if there was buildings without glass, it would just be a very dull world that we're living in. So mm -hmm. currently what work is being done in developing new glass materials for architecture applications and, you know, what benefits could come from this development? Great. So one of the challenges in architecture is how to make your buildings as energy efficient as possible. So, you know, you wanna keep them warm in the winter, keep them cool in the summer. And uh, you know, windows are, are great uh, for, for letting the light in and, and providing good thermal insulation, uh, but there's still room for improvement. Even with you know, modern double pane windows that are filled with a, a noble gas in, in between the two panes, uh, you know, they can still um, act to conduct heat. And one of the advances is, is what's called vacuum insulated glazing. And this is, uh, instead of having a noble gas between the two panes of glass, you would actually uh, pull a vacuum between. So there's, there's you know, literally nothing uh, <laughs> there. Uh, so the only, the only way to, to you know, transmit the heat would be radiatively. Uh, so if you have a vacuum in between the panes, um, the challenges are how do you make sure that that vacuum is maintained over the lifetime of the building? Um, so that's you know, decades worth of time. Uh, also, if you're pulling a vacuum that creates mechanical stresses on, uh, on the two panes of glass and how do you make sure that, that the glasses can withstand those stresses and also be plain parallel to each other? Um, so those are, are some of the challenges. Uh, another area in architecture is natural lighting. So how could we uh, you know, take more advantage of natural sunlighting and, and transmit that natural sunlighting even to interior rooms, for example. 
um, that would reduce the need for artificial lighting, give us a more natural spectrum of light to work with, and also reduce the associated energy costs. Um, so those are a couple of the areas. Another one is um, glasses that are used for photovoltaics. So um, of course, more and more people are putting solar cells on, on their roofs to, to help um, get uh, you know, natural uh, renewable energy and reduce the energy costs and, and help the environment. Uh, one of the problems, at least in some people's minds, is that it's maybe not aesthetically pleasing to have solar cells on top of your roofs. Sure. So actually, Tesla has come up with a, a new Tesla roof, which looks like regular shingles, uh, but is actually a photovoltaic. And uh, a glass is a, a key part of, of this Tesla roof. Uh, and this is just becoming rolled out over the past few years or so. But it's exciting because, you know, you could turn your entire roof into a solar cell and it looks just like a normal roof. We, we just, or you mentioned that aesthetics do play a role, at least with these Tesla cars and, um, you know, other applications as well. How much of a role does um, being aesthetically pleasing and looking attractive play a role into the glass industry as a whole? I think it plays a more important role than most people realize. And it has played a very important role throughout the history of glass. So, so uh, man-made glasses have existed for thousands of years and they have been used both for um, sort of utilitarian purposes, but also for their beauty. And uh, again, if you go to the Corning Museum of Glass, you can see many of these beautiful ancient glasses and see the evolution of of artistic glasses over the centuries. And you know, glass is an intrinsically beautiful material. It's a lustrous material. You can make it any color you want. Um, you can make it transparent, you can make it opaque, you can form it into any shape you want. Uh, it's smooth to the touch. It's just, and it, and it lasts over time. It, it doesn't, at least most glasses do not corrode much over time. So. Um, it, it is a beautiful material and, and uh, people have, have known that for, for many years. And you know, many of the, the most important applications of glass um, have also, uh, you know, the, the optical transparency of glass has been a key part of that. Right. And so even if it's not sort of overtly a requirement of many products, um, the fact that glass is aesthetically pleasing does play a role, um, you know, glasses. It's nice to the touch. It's it's visually pleasant. It's in addition to having all the the engineering properties that we wanted to have, and uh, I'm hoping that this um, trend continues because you know the, the possibilities of glass are are infinite, um, both in its chemical design because it's a non-crystalline material, uh, as well as in the shapes and the colors. Um, so it, it's really it's only limited by our imaginations. For sure. Wow. Wait, so, so on vacations and, you know, even field trips, I've been to like several, several churches with so many different stained glass um, artwork and they're absolutely beautiful. Can you talk about how they were put together, even though they were made like thousands of years ago and just like, they don't have the technology that we have now? Uh, sure. So when we consider stained glasses in, um, in these stained glass windows in cathedrals, um, so it does have a practical purpose, right? It has a practical purpose of, of letting light in and, and keeping out the harsh elements of, of the weather and so on. Um, it also has a, a theological person, uh, purpose in that oftentimes they're depicting religious figures or, or depicting scenes from the Bible, for example. Um, and uh, of course, that they're beautiful as well. So it's it's like artistic, it's um, you know, spiritual, and it's engineering. And um, you know the the advances of these colored glasses have that goes back centuries. And uh, the Phoenicians were the the first um, people to really understand and master the art of different colored glasses yeah. and actually they, they kept it a secret for a long time too. <laughs> um, it was it was a priest a priest named antonio neri who was the first person to publish a book 
um, kind of detailing the alchemy of glasses and different colored mm. glasses, if you will. And in this book, his, his love of glass just comes through. But this, this is the first time the, you know, the secrets of glass making had been published, and especially <laughs> Venetian glasses and different colored glasses. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that uh, Punit is a, a great example of the combination of the aesthetic appeal of glass as well as the, the engineering utility of glass. Wow. And, you know, this has really been a fantastic conversation about, you know, both material science and then, of course, uh, glass, which is just this incredibly ubiquitous material. So I'd like you to bottom line it for us. You know, our listeners at the end of this conversation, what would you like for them to take away from this conversation about the importance of glass in material science and engineering? So glass is one of the most important materials that has enabled modern human civilization. And, and it has transformed civilization in so many ways. And we are still at the beginning. And so there, there are so many more opportunities for developing new glass compositions, for finding new applications of glass. And even though it's a very old material, it is at the cutting edge of material science. Right. And the, the physics that's involved in the chemistry and the engineering and the artistic aspects too, it's, it's um, at least to me, it's, it's one of the most exciting uh, fields of study. Uh, and so I, I hope that this conversation will help people realize uh, you know, the importance and the beauty of glass and uh, the many opportunities that glass will have to continue to have a positive impact on humankind. Wow, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I know we really talked about so many different applications and you're, you're absolutely right, glass really is everywhere and I think you really showcased that. So you know, if our listeners want to reach out to you, what's the best way of doing that? Is that through LinkedIn or uh, your so website? LinkedIn is great, or send me an email, uh, jcm426 at psu.edu. Great. And we can link to your LinkedIn in the show notes below. Great. Thank you, Puneet. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We really appreciate your time today. And we learned a really tremendous amount about uh, this diverse area of glasses that, uh, and we, we look forward to a, uh, we look forward to being able to share this whole conversation with our audience. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. If you enjoyed the show, consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. If you want to meet other passionate material scientists and engineers, join our Discord community using the link in the description. If you have any feedback for us, we would love to hear it. We want to grow this show with our community's input, so comment below with your thoughts on this episode and what topics you want to see us cover next. We'll see you very soon, and in the meantime, go change the world. <laughs>